Good morning. Today we're going to get a double helping from Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. First I'll read the NIV, and then I'll read the message, which is a very different, refreshing version of the word. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it has been grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And now from the message. It wasn't so long ago that you were marred in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it, all of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did this all on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and he set us down in the highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Now God has us where he wants us with all the time in the world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does. The good work he has gotten ready for us to do. The work we had better be doing. The work we better be doing. I love that part about that from the message. If you'll bow with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your wonderful grace. That it is all your work. It's not our work. That there are no works of righteousness that could ever get us to heaven. In fact, if we looked at ourselves, we are dressed in filthy rags because we have sinned and rebelled against you. And yet you've been long-suffering and kind and patient. And you knew all from the beginning that it would cost your son's life that you could give up your son, take your wrath out on him instead of taking it out on us, all because you wanted the right relationship with us. That is your desire. So help us, Lord, through the power of the Spirit to remember what Jesus Christ did, that he gave up heaven, that he became flesh and blood, that he gave up his life to serve, to heal others, to, to preach to the least of these, to those that would listen and hear and bring salvation and eternal life. We thank you that, that he laid down his life willingly, that he went silent before his accusers, and that he rose again on the third day, that he taught more about the kingdom of God, and that he told us that we would be empowered by the Spirit, which we are today, born again and, and empowered by the Spirit, to live lives the way you planned from the very beginning, doing the things that Jesus did. So open our hearts and minds to hear what the Spirit has today to the churches, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm continuing on in Luke. And I called it, entitled this, The Motivation of the Disciple. 
We left off last week with be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. I hope you thought about that some. What does that mean to you? Do you know the definition of mercy compared to grace to compare to love? Do you have mercy on others because Christ had mercy on you? God had mercy on you. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Those passages that we read briefly said that there's so many passages that do in Scripture that just at the right time God sent His one and only Son, that, that Jesus Christ went joyfully to the cross, that He died for His enemies, that He was beaten to a pulp where He was hardly recognizable as a human being, that His friends betrayed Him, that He did no wrong whatsoever, that He washed Judas' feet knowing He was going to betray Him. The kind of mercy that no one, no matter how wonderful, how many good deeds they do, how, many, how righteous they are, no one holds a candle of deserving God's mercy. And Jesus, in this Sermon on the Plain, where we left off, says, Be merciful as your heavenly Father is mercy, merciful. So now I want you to think, if, it, if that helped you at all with mercy, have you withheld mercy from anybody? Not only are you being merciful, but have you deliberately withheld mercy? And if you're saying no, then let, let's, let me ask the question again. Have you ever withheld mercy from anyone? Would you want God to withhold His mercy from you? Let me give you a definition of mercy. This is from got, gotquestions.com. Um, their information's usually pretty good. Sometimes it's a little off, but the, I really like this definition. Mercy describes a divine attribute of God's nature, and we need to study the words in a biblical format. It used to be Webster's Dictionary was based off biblical definitions. Now it's so far from that, it, you don't even know. And, and Satan uses the definitions of words literally to, to dumb down our meaning. I mean, like I said before, and I'll say again, we can love French fries and we can love Jesus. There's a big, big difference. Mercy describes a divine attribute of God's nature. He is rich in mercy. Ephesians 2, 4 tells us that. And His mercy is great. Mercy is re revealed in the action God takes to relieve suffering and demonstrate His faithfulness and steadfast love. You're supposed to be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Are you trying to relieve suffering and demonstrate God's faithfulness and His steadfast love? Mercy is such an exceptionally complex concept that several Hebrew and Greek words are used to express the dimension of its meanings. Synonyms like compassion, loving kindness, favor, and steadfast love often appear in Bible translation to illustrate the idea of mercy. A brief de biblical definition of mercy is the gift of God's undeserved kindness and compassion. Undeserved love, undeserved merit or favor, because you didn't deserve it, but it's so much more because the purpose in it is to get you out of the pitiful state you're in and in fact in God's mercy to elevate you to where Christ is in heaven. On a human level, mercy is the benevolent or compassionate treatment of someone suffering or in need. Mercy is an attitude that moves us to act on behalf of the unfortunate. On a divine level, mercy is the foundation of forgiveness expressed in God's pardon of human sin. By His divine quality of mercy, God remains faithful to His covenant promises and His relationship with His pe people despite their unworthiness and faithlessness. So I'm going to repeat the first part of that paragraph. On a human level, mercy is the benevolent or compassionate treatment of someone suffering or in need. And I'm going to ask the question again, have you ever withheld mercy? Continuing on with the definition, when God revealed Himself to Moses, He emphasized the prominence of His mercy. The Lord passed in front of Moses calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfaithful, unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. You've got to put that definition in with mercy. 
In God's mercy, he shows leniency. He withholds punishment from sinners even though they deserve it. But in your great mercy, you did not destroy them, they com them completely or abandon them forever. What a gracious and merciful God you are, Nehemiah 9.31. God's mercy also causes him to give good gifts to those who are undeserving. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us, Luke 1, verse 78. Thus, mercy is related to grace. Jesus Christ is the fullest, most dynamic expression of God's mercy, Ephesians 2 again. In His earthly ministry, Jesus demonstrated compassion and mercy for the helpless and the suffering. We see that in Luke chapter 7 that we're coming up. Mercy motivated Christ to give Himself up for, as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, Ephesians 5, 2. So that through Him we might be for, forgiven of our sins, Hebrews 2, 7, and granted the gift of eternal life. The Bible beckons Christians to love mercy, Micah 6, 8, and be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful, what we just read in Luke 6, verse 36. Believers must show the same mercy and compassion towards one another that God demonstrates towards them. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Are you? Have you withheld mercy? Do you need to ask forgiveness and to give God to give you the power to show mercy to those who persecute you, to those who do not treat you kind, to those who talk bad about you? Oh, because especially if it's in the name of Jesus Christ, you're blessed. You can jump and leap for joy because your reward is great in heaven. The very next words that come after be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful in Luke chapter 6 is do not judge and you will not be judged. Now where does that put us in this, in this sermon on the plane? Do we judge? I don't think we want to be judged and we don't want to be judged by who? By God, our heavenly Father who is merciful to us, who does not withhold His mercy, who is long-suffering and kind, and the ultimate affection of His mercy is His Son dying on the cross for you and I. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Now, this is not saying we don't need to judge crimes, and the definition talked about that in God's mercy and everything. God is holy and righteous and just. So it's not talking about that. We're not, we're not supposed to, ju to not judge when there's a crime or anything, but we're not supposed to be, let me think of the word, judgmental. How is that? Especially when we look at the lowly state of someone else and we judge them because of the condition that they're in and say that's the reason you're in that condition so then therefore we withhold mercy. We're supposed to be merciful as our Heavenly Father is merciful. And remember Jesus is not teaching anything new. He's expounding on the law. We don't steal because we would rather make sure that someone has something rather than take something from them. We don't covet even if we don't have because we desire for them to have and if they have the same attitude as us and we are in need, they will want to supply to us. We don't have other gods because we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all of our strength and we love our neighbors as ourselves. Don't be judgmental in passing judgment on someone else, you hypocrite. We do it all the time, though, in spite of God's mercy. We are constantly a judgmental, hypocritical people. And we need to realize that so that we can ask for forgiveness, that we can ask for power by the Spirit to develop the fruits of the Spirit. Love, kindness, grace, mercy. Jesus' next command, I'm going to say command rather than words, do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. What happens if we do judge? The very next thing is you condemn. Whether these come from your mouth or not, the thoughts were in your head, and the, the thoughts came from your motives in your heart. Because you think you're more self-righteous than you are, or maybe it's you don't 
think of God's mercy and grace as highly as you ought to. Be careful how you stand, because you might fall. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned by God. So I've got to ask you, have you, consi- have you ever experienced God's mercy and forgiveness? Because if you have, how can we live lives where we are judgmental and condemn people? We were the same. We did the same things that the heathens do, and we still do them today, maybe to not as much extent. So let's not be judgmental and condemn. But we still do things that we shouldn't do. Maybe it's not as extreme as that, but what about this? Is that really how Christ would live? Are you really being merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful? If you have experienced God's mercy and forgiveness, shouldn't you be merciful to others so that they see Jesus Christ in you? Mercy is just like faith without actions. It's not there. It's dead. Because mercy demands action to change the person's state. And the ultimate state that you want to change in a person is their eternal salvation versus their eternal damnation for their sins. And you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven because you desire mercy rather than paying your sacrifices and your tithes. There are two negative commands here with two promises. Do not judge, do not condemn. If you do not judge and do not condemn, here's the promises. You won't be judged and you won't be condemned. Pretty clear. Are you going to judge and condemn? Because if you are, you're going to be judged and condemned. Whatever that means in your mind. Don't judge, you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. So what do you do? The very next words of Jesus. Forgive and you will be forgiven. A positive command. If you forgive, that's what you're called to do, you will be forgiven. The forgive is the opposite of being judgmental and condemning. You forgive. Well, how does that apply to different things? I can understand forgiving my brother who did something to me, but what about me just condemning the guy on the side of the road that holds up the sign that says, I need food, I need money to buy food for my family, or I need food for my family, homeless, whatever the sign is. Because we judge and condemn him. And I'm using him because it's just an easy example. We've all drove by and seen that sign and thought, well, he's a professional panhandler, or if if he quit drinking, he'd do that, or or, I don't have time for it. You're still denying mercy because mercy says, "I I feel something because of the state of that person and I want to help them. And the ultimate is to help their eternal situation so that they can be blessed. They can be in a right standing with God. I'm not telling you to stop every time you see somebody either. It's not my point. Don't don't take my words and twist it. I'm just using a good example because we can take that. So how do I apply forgive to that? Well, first of all, ask forgiveness for yourself to God because you did judge. And second of all, go and ask forgiveness for them for judging them. Maybe it will lead to non-condemnation and maybe it will lead to forgiving, which will lead to action. I don't know. I'm not the one who's tugging on the purse strings of your heart. It would be the Holy Spirit if you're born again because you have a heart of flesh and God's laws are written upon your heart and Jesus is expounding upon those laws and telling you how to truly live and the motivation behind them. That you're to be merciful because your heavenly Father is merciful to you. Don't take it for granted. So what about unresolved anger in your heart? Isn't that equivalent to murder? I don't tell me we haven't had that. You haven't had that towards anybody. And a lot of times it's towards your family because of something a brother did, a son did, a husband did, a wife did, whatever it is, and you just have irreconcilable differences. Was God not merciful to you? Do you take His mercy for granted? Do you harbor that anger inside of your heart? and commit murder inside of your heart? I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but someone who carries anger around in their heart is worse than a murderer. You can quote me on this. You can quote me on this one. Don't misuse me. 
Because the act of murder is a one-time usually act. Some of it's premeditated. We have the terms for that, and it's thought about over and over. But most acts are a crime of passion, a one-time act. That anger in your heart that you refuse to forgive somebody is day after day after day, and yet you cry out, Lord, Lord. We're going to get to that, aren't we? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? So do you have unresolved anger in your heart? <laughs> the command here is simple. Don't, don't judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. We are called to forgive as Christ Jesus forgave us of every iniquity, every sin of standing by and not just being an innocent bystander as they watched them crucify our Lord In Daniel chapter 9, we can get a little more idea about God's mercy and where we are in this picture. Daniel 9, starting in verse 9. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness. Even though we have rebelled against Him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in His ways, which He set before us through His servants and prophets, all of Israel has transgressed. All have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey your voice. So the oath and the curse written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. And I talked about that when we started out this passage of blessings and woes, or maybe you could call them blessings and cursings. God does not intend to curse you, but your actions are your curse if you disobey. There is a consequence, and you choose whether you choose life or death, blessings or cursings, based on how you obey the Lord your God. And the fact that we know of His mercy, that He would give His one and only Son for us, and then we're lawbreakers? You have carried out the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under all of heaven, nothing has ever been done like this that has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the laws of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquities and giving attention to the truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it upon us. What about us? who cry out, Lord, Lord, but don't do what He said. Who say we're a Christian, but we live lives that don't show mercy and grace, that don't show forgiveness and love. <coughs> For the Lord our God is righteous in all He does, yet we have not obeyed His voice. Now, O Lord our God, who brought Your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, who made for Yourself a name renowned to this day, we have sinned, we have acted wickedly. O oh Lord, in keeping with all of your righteous acts, I pray that your anger and wrath may turn away from, from your city Jerusalem, from your holy mountain. For because of our sins and iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all around us. So now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of our servant. For your sake, O Lord, cause your face to shine upon your desolate sanctuary. Incline your ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. For we are not presenting our petitions before you because of our, our righteous acts, but because of your great compassion. Daniel is crying out to God in the state of captivity, and God is faithful. And he cries out to him, not because of any of our righteous works, which Ephesians tells us, but by God's grace, his compassion, and his mercy, save us, set us free. And Jesus came to set the captives free, to give sight to the blind. Have your eyes been opened. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. If you believe this, if you understand this at all, how can you judge and how can you for, for condemn? Let alone if you know the mercy of God, how can you choose to not forgive? How many times should you forgive? Surely seven times is enough, right? No, seven times 70. For an infinite amount of times because 
Let's start adding our sins up and see when one becomes too many. But we give forgiveness as Christ forgave us. Now, that doesn't mean you don't set boundaries. That doesn't mean that you're abused, anything else. That means that you offer forgiveness. In Isaiah 55, we read these words starting in verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked man forsake his own way and the righteous man his own thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. So forsake your own way and your own thoughts. Kind of like Romans 12, 1, to change your mind so that you can be transformed. But you've got to set yourself apart from this world and look different than the world. By the way, not that you just talk, but by the way you live in this world by the good things that you do. <clears throat> Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion. And to our God, for he will freely pardon because he forgives. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, neither are your ways my ways. We have, must have the mindset of Jesus Christ, who while beaten to a position of not looking like a human being cried out father forgive them for they do not know what they're doing Philippians chapter 2 we read these words of Paul to a different church therefore if you have any encouragement in Christ as Philippians 2 verse 1 therefore if you have any encouragement in Christ and any comfort from his love if you have any fellowship with the spirit if you have any affection and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love as Jesus, being united in spirit and in purpose. So therefore do nothing out of selfish ambition or out of empty pride, but in humility considers, consider others more important than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, it's not telling you not to look to them, but also to the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. What did he do? He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Have you received God's forgiveness for your sin? Forgiveness, again, doesn't mean that you're going to forget it. That's not what forgiveness means. doesn't mean I'll forgive and I'll never say anything about it. doesn't mean that you forgive and you don't set boundaries. It means that you forgive in spite of the evil that has been done to you, the harm that has been done to you. You forgive you have to forgive. Even if the person doesn't come to you and ask forgiveness, you have to forgive them in your heart because God forgave you of your sins. You can't harbor that inside. It will eat you up. It will keep you from being in a blessed, right state with God because you're harboring murder day after day in your heart. You have to forgive. It's not, there's nothing said in here about how the person receives the forgiveness. It's forgive and you will be forgiven. That is the command. No stipulations tied to that. Like I said, common sense and we can take other scripture. We can put other things in, like I said, of setting up the boundaries, not being abused, anything else. I'm not saying that, so don't misquote my words. But don't let that sin, that hatred, harbor in your hearts like murder. If you believe that the Bible says that God forgives us our sin by faith, that you know that the Bible also says that God will not forgive you unless you forgive. Isn't that what that scripture says? It says forgive and you'll be forgiven, but let's change it. Let's flip the other side of the coin. If you don't forgive, will you be forgiven? doesn't mean that your salvation will be taken away, nothing else. It means you don't really understand God's forgiveness. 
So you might just cry out on that day, Lord, Lord, which he already says here, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I command you to do. But you might even hear on that day, Lord, Lord, we've done mighty works in your name. But we did them for works of righteousness, which we've done not out of faith, not out of a loving heart. And we've harbored that sin in our heart. We tied to the, to the least increment of our mints and spices, money, whatever it is, but we neglected mercy and grace because we just couldn't find it in our heart to forgive that person. So we judged and condemned them. And we certainly looked like hypocrites and didn't proclaim Jesus Christ because He forgave. Even from the cross. Forgive and you will be forgiven. It's in the Lord's Prayer. It's stated in, here in, in uh, Luke's version on the plane. It's stated in Matthew's um, Sermon on the Mount. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day of our debts as we forgive others. That sin debt that we have that we can't pay, that we owe the wages, what we deserve for what we've done in our flesh. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Jesus does not say to forgive as long as the sin is not too horrible, does He? He doesn't say forgive to a certain point. He says, forgive in spite of these things, just as I forgave you. Like I said, it doesn't mean we just take it. doesn't mean we dismiss it. doesn't mean we can't set up precautions. We are called to forgive because God is a forgiving God and we understand that God forgave us for all eternity of our sins. God doesn't forget our sins. Don't twist Scripture. Yeah, it says that God separates our sins, right? It doesn't say He forgets them. And Scripture clearly tells us that we will all give an account of everything that we do, everything that we say, even every thought, even every idle word. Psalms 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, Bless His holy name. This is what I'm supposed to do with my soul and my life. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and do not forget all His kind deeds because He forgave me and He shows me mercy and compassion every day. Every breath I take. He who forgives all of our iniquities and heals all of our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with loving devotion and compassion who satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteous and, righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses, His deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving devotion. He will not always accuse us nor harbor His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins or repaid us according to our iniquities. He has been merciful and we are to be merciful as our Heavenly Father is merciful. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His loving devotion to those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Don't misquote that scripture. He's removed them from us. He has pardoned them. They're not forgotten. He has pardoned us in spite of them. He has known about our sins before time ever began. He's known about our sins when He was dying on the cross for our sins and cried out, Forgiveness! As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those for, who fear him. So the tie here to the to separation from the east to the west then goes into a father that has compassion on his child. I'll never disown my child. He'll always be my son. I might have those thoughts in my head, then I have to, to go to God about them. 
but I'll never disown him. And he is a blessing and a heritage from the Lord. But it doesn't mean that I not, did I dismiss his sin or anything else. I separate that and look at him with the eyes of Jesus and, and offer love and compassion and grace. And it's a tough mix. But I do that because God has given me those things. And I pray and I pray and I pray that he sees Christ in me rather than hypocrisy because the world is so full of hypocritical Christians. As a father has compassion on his children, they sin. You set up boundaries. You don't forget it. You ground them. You do punishment, whatever it is, but you don't stop loving them. You may even separate yourself from them because you don't want to be around at all because of the sin. and You don't even talk to them, but you don't stop loving and praying for them. Just as a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. How can you not have mercy and compassion and love even for your enemies? Is there anything that you would not forgive your child for or anyone else? Then do you understand God's forgiveness for you? I say that and I know plainly that there are people in our lives that we withhold forgiveness for them. So how can, how can we ever not be merciful to them if we do that? We are individuals who are selfish. That's why most marriages fail. <laughs> that aren't loving and kind, who think of their own needs and who will not forgive as Christ forgave them who will not be merciful as their heavenly Father was merciful to them. And the sad thing is, like I said, one day you might find out the truth if you don't have that right relationship. There's another problem when it comes to thinking about forgiveness, especially our own forgiveness with God. Oftentimes we don't really ask for forgiveness. We do ask for pardon. We do make excuses. So we ask to be excused from that sin. And we say again, Lord, you know that I'm weak and, and I'll continue to sin in this. Help me with this. But do you really understand His forgiveness that He will forgive, He will forgive, He will forgive, but He will also empower you to live a life where you don't have to continue to ask forgiveness for the same sins over and over again. It is... His will for you to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect also. Not meaning without sin, but complete. That you're done with sin because you've overcome this already, not because of your own power or your own might, but because you've let Jesus be Lord and take that from you. So that you can live without that sin anymore. Whether it's a sin of adultery, whether it's a sin of hatred in your heart. You don't have to live with those sins. So when we ask for forgiveness, are we genuine when you ask for forgiveness? Think in your own relationships again. You do something to hurt somebody and you come and ask forgiveness and then you throw a, a stipulation with it. But I, I didn't really mean that. Or But if you ask forgiveness, you ask for forgiveness. And if you really mean it, it is penetrating your heart that you've sinned against that person. And of course you've sinned against God. And the same goes the other way around. So do you ask for true forgiveness and do you learn and know what it truly means to forgive? Asking for real forgiveness means that you know that you really sinned. That you hurt someone. And if you think of them over yourselves, you would want them to do the same thing to you as you would do to them, the golden rule which we've already read in this scripture. So you would want them to forgive you. And you're to forgive no matter the horror of the sin. Because the more the horror of the sin, the more it shows God's grace in your life. Forgiving others says, yes, you have done this thing, 
but I accept your, poly, your apology. I will never hold it against you. That's a quote, quote from C.S. Lewis. If one was really to blame, if one was not really to blame, then there is really nothing to forgive, is there? When you can forgive, the greater the atrocity of the crime, the greater the forgiveness, and you're starting to get a glimpse of God's forgiveness for you. How can someone think that God's forgiveness is not great? Greater than all of our sins. How can you think that you can't forgive someone else for what they've done for you? Forgiving others, God will forgive you. It is proof that you've been forgiven. But how many times, Lord, I addressed that earlier. Well, let's go there. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? This personal sin or injury to me, up to seven times? Surely that's enough. And this is Peter asking this after he's been walking with our Lord. Jesus answered, I tell you, not just seven times, but 70 times. Because of this... What does Jesus say next? The kingdom of heaven is like. Do you understand this? Do you understand about forgiveness? Let me tell you about the kingdom of heaven. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom of come. And you're still going to be here on earth ushering in the kingdom, presenting the kingdom to others. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlements, a debtor was brought to him owing 10,000 talents. Since a man was unable to pay, the master ordered that he be sold to pay his debt, along with his wife and children and everything he owned. Then the servant fell on his knees before him. Have patience with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Verse 27. His master had compassion on him, did what as a result? Forgave his debt. What did he do also besides that? Released him. Okay, we don't need to go examining this in great detail, how great this debt was, but it was a great debt, and the guy couldn't pay it. And it was going to cost him imprisonment and his wife imprisonment and his children imprisonment because of the debt that he had amassed to the one who loaned him the money. Mm, let's call it my life. And how can I ever pay back that? My sin debt. I can't. So the only thing I can do is like Daniel and cry out to a God of compassion and grace. So how could I withhold that from someone else? And hope that He is merciful and know that He is merciful because it is His character and I'm supposed to be merciful as my Heavenly Father is merciful. But then verse 28 starts out this way, but, okay, why is there a but there? Because this man did not understand forgiveness. He did not understand mercy. He did not understand grace. He did not understand the debt of his sins that he could not pay. He did not care about his wife and his children per se in that manner either and, and live in holy fear because of that, that he, his life with his debt that he made was endangering them also. So understanding all these things, when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, minor in comparison. He grabbed him and began to choke him, saying, Pay me back what you owe me. Now, there's got to be judgmentalism here. There's got to be condemnation here. There's certainly not forgiving here. And there's not understanding of all of God's grace and our, our sin debt that we have before God that He has forgiven us of. So his fellow servant fell down and begged him, Have patience with me and I'll pay you back. Same thing, I'm begging you for mercy. But the man refused. Instead he went and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay his debt. When his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and recounted all of this to their master. So when the world sees your behavior and how you live, Christ forgave you, but oh, you're going to harbor this in your heart against this person. The world sees it and finds it atrocious. So they don't want to be like Christ because they know too many Christians who don't live like Christ in this world. 
But then the master, it's time for that. The master summoned him and declared, you wicked servant. And that may not happen today, but it will happen at judgment. I forgave you of all your debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured, not just jailed, until he should repay all that he owed. That is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Can it be any clearer? Forgive and you will be forgiven. Flip side of that coin, don't forgive then. Maybe you won't be forgiven. Maybe you'll be tortured until you can pay that sin debt back instead. And let me tell you how long that is. It's called eternity. Do you have these principles defined yet? So then what does t Jesus teach? His next words are to give. To give what? Are we talking about giving money? Are we talking about giving time? Or are we talking about just giving compassion and love and grace and doing something about it because of the state that the person's in that we see? Forgiveness has to be your foremost thought here because it comes right after that. And then you can look backwards and say, oh, have I been condemning? Have I been judging? What is the attitude of your heart? Then, if you want to, you can reach into your time and your possessions and go and help that man instead of condemn him. Be a witness to him. Build a relationship with him instead of passing him by on the other side as the Levite and the priest did. And it was the Samaritan, the scumbag, who offered grace and mercy, not knowing at all why that man, his enemy, was laying there on the side of the road bleeding. And then he did reach into his pocketbooks. He said, I'll pay for his treatment and everything, and I'll come back, and if I owe you more, I'll pay that as well. It doesn't that the definition of loving your neighbor? Verse 38, give what? And it will be given to you. Give. If you can forgive, you can learn to give then. Kindness, love, compassion, develop a friendship, a relationship, a strange family relationship, whatever it is, because you chose to forgive, and then you give whatever it is that you're giving. I can't define that for you, and every relationship is different, but the Holy Spirit will guide you. Given it will be given to you. How will it be given? A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. If you don't understand anything about that, and probably some of us do as we get ourselves a little older, you go to the general store and they pull out a bag and you put it in there of grain or whatever it is, and this is what it's referring to, and they put it in there and you buy the bag of grain. But don't you get more grain if they take and shake it down? and pack more in there, and you shake it down, and if you give whatever it is that you're giving, that's the same measure that's going to be back to you. The more that you can put in that to the point of overrunning, it's going to be given back to you and poured into your lap from God. Certainly in the life to come. Jesus tells His disciples when they said, we've given up everything to follow you. He says, you will receive a hundredfold in this life and then eternal life. He didn't mean money. But the peace and the joy and the love that comes from Jesus, the confidence of your salvation of being in a blessed standard so that you can jump in for joy because you know great is your reward in heaven. But whatever measure that you use, that's how it's going to be measured back to you. So if you're skimpy and putting it in the bag, you're going to be skimpy and getting back. Whatever it is. Love is shown or proved on how you give to a relationship. And you can't do that until you have forgiven you can't do that if you condemn and you judge. So then verse 39 says he also told them this parable, a further teaching illustration. You remember, this is the disciples. He just picked 12. They've come down off the mountain to the level plain. And he started out with saying, blessed are you when <laughs> you're not going to believe this because it's going to look like blessed from the world, but blessed are you when you're poor and hungry and when people persecute you and spit upon you and exclude you, all because of my name, because great is your reward in heaven. Can the blind lead the blind? Will both not fall into a pit? The disciples were called, and you were a disciple. At Antioch, they were first called Christians because they were acting like Christ, but if you want to follow after Jesus, then you're his disciple. 
which must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after him. If you're a disciple training to be like the master, can someone who's still blind lead the others who are blind? If you are still blind, won't you fall into a pit and won't you lead them into the pit also? And if you're not forgiving someone that you love, say you love, I'm talking family member again instead of enemy, but enemy as well, won't you blindly be leading them into a pit because you haven't seen God's salvation in the eyes that you should see salvation, the eyes through Jesus Christ, your Savior and your Lord? The golden rule which Jesus has already said says to do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. So I can't judge and con condemn. I can't not forgive because I see the state that they're in and I have mercy on them instead of being a hypocrite. Remember that phrase, to learn the meaning. He was trying to teach the Pharisees this to draw them to repentance. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's what God desires Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given unto you. Do you hear these words? Then he closes out this passage with, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you're, you yourselves fail to see the plank in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. You might remember before, I don't remember how many years ago, I put a pair of glasses and put a paper towel roll on it that long. That's not a, not a log. And I tried to get to Bob and I kept hitting him in the face because of the log that was there. So I couldn't get to him to give him a hug or love because of that log that was in my eye. But see, the definition of that log there is a load-bearing member that would support up a building. Because you're supposed to build your foundation, and we'll get to that next week, on Jesus Christ, the firm foundation. And if you're building it on something else, your hypocrisy and everything, there's no way you can love your brother. There's no way you can help him out of his sinful acts. You, you can't help him out of the depraved situation he's in because the whole acts of loving kindness is to lead him to salvation through Jesus Christ. So are you being non-judgmental, non-condemnational? Are you forgiving? Are you being merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful? First, get the plank out of your own eye so that you can see clearly. Wow, Jesus' words here are powerful. And He means every one of them. They're commands. Christians are to be known in the world that they live in like Christ. They're wholly set apart doing the things that Christ Jesus did for them until they meet Him face to face. Yes, they're to do it in a pagan, unforgiving, hateful world. And the more that we love, the more that we forgive, the more that it will be seen, and the more abuse you probably will take. But the more that it will be seen that you serve your Master who is in heaven. And as Peter writes, you know, one day because of your godly lives, maybe someone will come up to you and driven by the Spirit to ask you your testimony why you live the way you live because they've seen Christ Jesus in you. Father in heaven, we thank you for the words of Jesus. Lord, may we first come to you and remove that plank out of our own eyes so that we can be used by you. Oh, the God of all great and wonderful things. It is so amazing, so far beyond our comprehensions, whose thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts, would give His one and only Son to die for our sins. Oh yeah, you could have came yourself, but you sent your Son. And I know by having one child that I would have went and got Him off and gladly taken His place. But you allowed your Son to die for my sins, for the sins of all of your enemies. 
and the fact that I do get a glimpse, Lord, help me to understand how great, how marvelous, how wide, how infinite your mercy and your grace is. Lord, help me by the power of the Spirit to be more like Christ, to increase my faith, that I may live a life of love, a life of forgiveness. Father, we thank you and praise you that Jesus cried out from the cross, forgive them, Lord, for they do not know what they do. How great a salvation we have. May we live it with holy fear, knowing that you love us so greatly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.